Hello, my name is Margaret Adele, and I have decided to wade into discourse. I don't do this a lot. In fact, there's really only one other video on my channel that I could even call any kind of like drama or hot take, and that's from like a year ago. But I've been watching some things on Twitter, and I realized that I have some opinions on things and maybe a slightly different perspective than a lot of people in the community, and I thought, why not? I'm on Christmas break. I have time. Let's try it. So this year uh, has been horrible. Yes. And a day or two ago, or maybe a couple of days ago, there was this beginning of discourse that maybe we shouldn't do the worst books of 2020 lists this year. The worst books of 2020 or the worst books of any year is a staple end of the year video for booktube. Uh, booktube loves getting retrospective at the end of the year, and I love that it does a lot of uh, best and worst books, most surprising, most disappointing, a lot of things, the biggest standouts, what have you. And the arguments against the worst books of 2020 are kind of twofold. Uh, the first one being that this year's been horrible, so why should we have more negativity on top of it when we can avoid it? And two, the fact that most debuting authors this year have had more struggles than normal, and even standard authors, authors that have already had their platforms have struggled because A, shipping for sales got weird with ev everything, and also, two, there's general economic downturn and layoffs, so people have less money to spend on books. Therefore, authors have been struggling a lot this year. They can't even go on signings to promote anything, so they're kind of screwed in more ways than one. And I can see this. I can see the idea of let's keep as much negativity away as possible, but the thing is, both of these things are kind of bad faith arguments. The first one, that we should not add any more negativity, being that these are videos that are very clearly labeled with what they are. If you don't want to watch them, then don't. Personally, I will not be doing a Worst Books of 2020 this year because this year has been very stressful for me, and I would rather be happy and focus on all the fun things and talk about all the books I love because I read some fantastic books this year. Shami Stobel had a good year, and so I did too. But that doesn't mean I'd ever look at someone else and be like, you shouldn't do this because I can't handle the negativity. I mean, it's very clear that you just avoid that video. Focus on that booktuber's best of 2020 list or most surprising or any of the other positive retrospective end of your videos. There's probably going to be a lot of them. And then there is the second argument that I think has taken a bit more precedence in the current discourse, and that is that these worst of 2020 books are uh, injurious, shall we say, to authors that have already had a struggle of a year. And to me, it seems like that a little bit doesn't fully understand exactly what those videos are, because any worst or best of this year videos aren't just about books that were published in that year. They're the books that that booktuber or bookish person read in that year. So I've already had some ideas of the books I'm going to put on my best of 2020 list, and one of them was published literally a decade ago. So it's not like it's specifically targeting authors that were published this year. Now, obviously, those authors will probably make those lists because undoubtedly there are booktubers that, you know, read those authors this year. But it's not specifically to this year's publishing, but this year's reading. But of course, those authors could be effective. So the greater uh, general discourse has, of course, turned to people talking about books negatively affects authors negatively. And this is the part where I feel like I have a very specific viewpoint, because unlike a lot of booktubers that review books who can be reasonably sure a lot of the time that the authors won't pay much attention to those reviews, I don't have that luxury. The vast majority of the books I review are self-published, meaning that the person who sent me the email asking for the review is 99% of the time the person that wrote it, and they will then usually subscribe to me or, or follow me on Twitter or follow my Goodreads or whatever. Sometimes they'll ask me repeatedly if I've read it yet, and can we not? <laughs> But I am very hyper aware of the fact a lot of the time that the authors I'm reviewing will be seeing my reviews. Almost always they at least know what's happening, if not are watching me very closely. <laughs> And yes, to a certain extent, that does affect a little bit in the way that I review books and a little bit in the way that I talk about books. Uh, you may notice if you've been following my reviews, I have never done a 
one star review. Like a full standalone review video for an indie book has never gotten a one star. That does not mean that I have at least found every book that I've read to be a two star or that I am faking it and adding on stars so that I never have to give an indie book a one star. I do have some indie books that I've given one stars to that I can do whole rants about. But in general, for me, if a book is a one star, like part of the way through the book, I just DNF. And that doesn't save me from not having to spread the negativity to that author because I then have to <laughs> message them back and be like, hey, I started reading your book and I don't like it enough to even continue it. I hate sending those messages. I've only had to send about five of those messages, maybe six so far in the two years I've been on BookTube, but I'm super happy about that. But regardless, even when I do publish a two-star review, I can be reasonably sure that the author is going to see that. That does not stop me from that two-star review though. Never has. And in most cases, with one exception, the authors are at least understanding of what that two star means. That there are genuine things that I struggled with and I will usually list them in the video. X, Y, and Z is why I gave this book two stars. And in a lot of cases, and this was surprising to me, we still continue the working relationship. Like there was one two star review where the author literally commented and was like, yeah, I was pretty sure this book wasn't my best work, but it was just a story I felt like I needed to get out. Which adds the question of, if you knew that, why were you sending it out for review? But regardless, I've got a lot of indie authors who I gave their work two star reviews. They saw the review and they're still subscribed to me. They still comment on videos because indie authors understand for the most part that that's just part of the game and that me saying X about their book is not me saying X about them as a person. So if indie authors, these authors that are more vulnerable than traditional authors who have less defenses, less people that are like assigned to working with them and assigned to helping them can take these low star reviews, these negative critiques about their books. Why are we giving traditionally published authors who have presses, who have agents, who have more of that work up, who may not even be seeing any of these videos anyway, why are we giving them more leeway? Why are we being more like protective of them. And this is kind of a version of discourse that's happened before the whole oh negative reviews in, in relation to the author. And I, I thought, I really thought now that we had all understood as a community that reviews are never for the author. I've actually had a couple indie authors that low key actually did make some edits to their books because of my reviews, but that's never the point of it. And I've actually had indie authors that would message me and would give me the plots of books that I was actually really interested in. But then at the end, they'll say something to the effect of, and if you don't find this book to your taste or whatever, uh, I ask for, what do they call it? Private feedback or something to that extent. And I could have loved the idea of the synopsis that they presented with me. And the few times that I've seen like that kind of phrasing at the end of the email, insta no. If I'm not sure that you can take a semi-negative or negative review, I will not review your book. I will not start any working relationship with an indie author that cannot take criticism. I am an anxious person as it is. I already can get worried about how certain authors will respond. Thankfully, I've only ever had one get like really, really not a good look response, <laughs> but they're low-key. Maybe another one who hasn't responded to the review yet, but I can't be sure if it's because they just haven't seen it yet or they've seen it and let it slide. And I'm, I'm still low key on edge about it because I don't want to have to deal with that kind of email in my inbox again. But again, if indie authors can understand that negative reviews are just a thing that happens, why are we giving so much leeway to traditional authors? And also indie authors, the power dynamic between me and the authors that I review is much smaller than a traditional booktuber and traditional authors. There are even some rare instances in which you could say I have more social clout or political power than the author whose work I'm reviewing, especially if it's a debut author who didn't build up a platform beforehand. Now, that's not common the majority of the time. It is still the author that has a bigger platform than me, and I don't really need to have more power over authors. No, thank you. But when we give authors leeway to be like mean or, you know, be very public about being mad about good faith 
criticism, not like, you know, criticism laced with sexism or racism or whatever, then you are basically killing off the review system as a whole. Because if you're a reviewer and the idea of an author sticking their entire fan base on you is a possibility, why would you review? <laughs> Why wouldn't you give an honest review at all if you could be setting yourself up for uh, a fan base coming down on you for having an opinion? It's generally a horrible idea to even start and set up that concept. But the concept of worst books in general is, is a little bit more than just a, a regular review. It's usually a, I liked these books the absolute least of any book I read this year. But honestly, still a valid opinion still something you're allowed to say. And again, you can still easily avoid those videos. It's standard in booktube to not show the books you're talking about in those kind of list videos to like entice the, the person to come in and watch the whole thing. So it's not like you would know at a glance what books are in there. So you could just ignore it, go on your merry way. Maybe the author's book is in there, but they'll never know and it doesn't matter. Their mental health continues as is. They, well, probably are still having a hard year, but this is not something that we should put on the reviewers. The mental health of the author is not the responsibility of the reviewers. Never has been. If you as an author cannot handle negative reviews of your book, if you cannot separate yourself from your writing and accept that negative reviews of your book are not negative reviews of yourself, then you should not be publishing. Wait a bit, grow a thicker skin, accept it as part of the whole setup, as annoying as it is. You don't have to like it. I don't think anyone does. But just accept that it's part of it and don't try to police it. And a lot of people have been talking about how this falls into toxic positivity. The idea that rather than finding genuine reasons to be positive, we are, you know, policing things and forcing things to be positive. And I definitely feel like the word toxic positivity gets thrown around a lot, but it does feel applicable here. Like how rather than admitting that, yeah, this year has sucked and that, yeah, complaining can be cathartic for people, saying that pol policing is the way to go and we should be restricting things. It's, well, it's not creating positivity. You're, you're restricting things. You're telling people that they're bad for having their opinions and that they should not be voicing their opinions. And that's also not helping anyone's mental health. And in general, again, you could just not watch the videos. <laughs> and what really shocked me, surprised me was the one video that kind of kicked off this discourse proper was one specific booktuber, uh, How to Train Your Gavin or Gav. And I don't think the, the discourse was like aimed at him personally at all. I don't think that everyone's like, he's responsible. I think he was just one of the first ones to start it. I, I remember like I looked, I looked through and I was like, wow, what books are he t is he talking about? And one of them was like a Becky Albertalli book. What? <laughs> she's had her book turned into a movie. I'm pretty sure she's fine. <laughs> like a lot of these traditional authors that they're talking about are big names and are like perfectly fine and probably don't care about reviews or probably have learned to not look at them at all. Like. So this idea of all these smaller debut authors who are struggling this year uh, being harmed by these videos isn't even a thing with one of the first big videos that came out this year. And I've heard the video is is funny. I've heard that the drunk rambling is is hilarious. Um, I don't know if I will watch the full thing because again, I personally want to stick to happy things because this year. Ugh. I, I just had to get my foster parent license in a pandemic, of course. But regardless, in general, I would love to hear your opinions. I'm sure there are aspects of this discourse that I missed. As I said before, I don't wade into these things often, but as someone who regularly has to think about or deal with the fact that the authors I'm reviewing are directly seeing my reviews and my opinions on their book on a regular basis, I feel like this was something that I was uniquely suited to <laughs> as a discourse. That was a sentence, right? Um, but regardless, I would love to hear what your thoughts are about this. Uh, do you think people should be doing worst books of 2020 lists? Do you think that you will be making and or watching those? Um, have you ever watched one of those and just 
100% disagreed with everything they said. I would love to know that. If you are another bookish person, I would love to know. If you ever had an author respond to your opinions on their book very poorly, uh, because again, that, that one time that it happened, it was not fun. I think I still have the screenshots of the email somewhere, but I literally blocked them on it everything because I'm like I'm not doing this again with you. Regardless, thank you so much for watching. I hope this was at least an interesting video if nothing else. And with nothing else to say, I hope you have a wonderful day and a marvelous tomorrow.